Welcome to St. Stephen's. We gather here to help one another grow in love for neighbor, self, creation, and God. We're here in love and we're glad you're here. Now, if you're joining us on Sunday morning, we hope that this pre-recorded service of devotions finds you well. We also have in-person worship on Sundays at 8 and 10. Now, let us begin this morning with a portion of Psalm 90. Teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long will you tarry? Be gracious to your servants. Satisfy us by your loving kindness in the morning. So shall we rejoice and be glad all the days of our life. Make us glad by the measure of the days that you afflicted us and the years in which we suffered adversity. Show your servants your works and your splendor to their children. May the graciousness of the Lord our God be upon us. Prosper the work of our hands. Prosper our handiwork. Teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go sell what you own and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard will it be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God? And the disciples were perplexed at those words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals... It is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news will not receive a hundredfold now in this age. Houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children, and fields with persecutions. And in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Now the teacher collected his students and set out to do the work. It seems like a long time ago, but it wasn't that long ago. Not ages, a generation, but maybe a year. Not long. 
and he healed people by the thousands. It was incredible. All kinds of people, sick kids, parents, grandparents, spouses, cousins, right? and assorted maladies, right? even people possessed by demons. But then the people kept coming constantly, every single day. The teacher was literally surrounded. He couldn't move, eat, or leave. The crowds began to push and became an imminent danger. So the teacher put space between himself and the crowd. He literally climbed into a boat and he continued his ministry. This is the first sign of what the teacher is up to, right? That he didn't come to heal individuals. Right? He came to heal the world. And that is not done by only healing individuals. The people also needed to hear and learn and grow. And that is when he took his students aside, called them teachers, and sent them out to do the work themselves. Now, in the story, when this young man shows up looking for the teacher to evaluate him, he's expecting that he's already aced the class, right? It's like he thinks he can test out of the intro and intermediate classes, that he's got a you know, straight shot into the upper level ones. It's like the professor who will just give him an A for being awesome so he can go on to the stuff that really matters. But Jesus flips the script. That's his favorite teacher move, right? To turn you upside down to see the world in a completely different way. And why he said earlier that the first shall be last and servant of all, right? right? The point isn't just to reverse engineer the order of the queue. It's because we think greatness, being first and best and greatest, is about making others serve you to do what you want. For the teacher, this is not a rhetorical technique, however. It's actually his worldview. And ours, the one that we've inherited, is predictably opposite. We're the deviants who need to be shown a different way. Now, we usually refer to the story as being about the rich man or the rich young man, which is pretty reasonable, right? It does say, right, that when Jesus tells him to give away his stuff, he gets upset and runs away for he had many possessions, right? And then Jesus talks about wealth and the kingdom in a way that sounds like, hey, if you got a bunch of cash, you're not getting in. So from our side of this flipped script, this sounds exactly like a condemnation of wealth. And in a sense, the disciples agree with us. And yet this gospel isn't about money, but it is totally about money. We're just looking at it backwards. So let's join Jesus in the flip. Now, Jesus gives us a clue to the problem from the moment the man greets him. Okay? He calls him good teacher. And while many focus on the man's narrow understanding of Jesus by only referring to him as teacher, Jesus objects to the other word, good. Why do you call me good? 
No one is good but God alone. Because the man has already made his biggest mistake. He assumes the purpose of life is to be good. Like any good student seeking the approval of his teachers, he sees the measure of his worth by the grade the teacher will give him. In his mind, the grade follows the worth. So being good is reflected in personal piety. And this man's resume is unimpeachable. But Jesus tries to show him how he's got it backward. None of us is good. We're called to do good. But it doesn't end there. There is no arriving at good because it is not a destination or an evaluation. You can't earn the designation of good. Right? Because you can't earn grace. That is the root of everything. You can't earn grace because it can only be given. The pious young man wants to be assured of his place by doing something. Like, if he can get an A in the class of life, then he can be assured of graduating into heaven. And yet, with the arrogance that always follows certainty like a lapdog, he wants assurance now of something a long time from now. He's the phenom who graduates from MIT at 16 and wants Jesus to call him a perfect little boy. You did everything right. You win life. So Jesus tells him he's missing one thing. Absence. He doesn't know how not to have everything he wants. You did everything, right? What you need is insecurity. So he must sell his stuff, give the money to the poor, and follow Jesus like a student. Trust, live, learn. Embrace this uncertain future. So why then is Jesus talking to his disciples about wealth. He told this pious young man to give up everything, be generous, and follow him. And yet, we want this moment to reflect a universal ruling about money that can answer our insecurity about our wealth. In other words, where does Jesus draw some lines here? And this is when we must realize just how much we sound like this pious young man. We're asking Jesus for a ruling. Am I good? Now, right about now, we should get some comfort from the fact that the disciples have both missed the point in the exact same way we do. And he does. And also gotten the point they jumped to the conclusion that under Jesus' vision of things, none of them would be saved. Which objectively is kind of crazy, right? They've given everything up to follow Jesus. They don't have anything. So in Jesus' inverse greatness hierarchy, first being last, last being first, right? They are closer to the front of the line than this guy. But they also sense that there's something else here. Something that trips them up, too. They feel condemned by this teaching. Even as they have far fewer resources and far more commitment to the Missio Dei, mission of God, they are feeling hopeless. They are hearing Jesus from the wrong side of the flip. So Jesus brings them back to the kingdom side. 
saying, for mortals, it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. They were in the pious young man's headspace, right? Thinking they could earn grace. No, it isn't that wealth is a permanent disqualifying state. There aren't any, right? None of us is good. That's what Jesus said moments earlier. We aren't good. Only God is good. It isn't about our state of being, our character, who we think we are. Our salvation is not contingent on these things. So think about all of the implications. Sexual orientation, physical ability, gender identification, race, creed, age, nationality, education, value to society. None of that matters. It does not factor into salvation. And we can't earn our way in. It's about grace, generous grace. It's not about doing something to prove yourself worthy of grace. We aren't trying to learn the cheat code to get into the good place. And we can't say the magic words that force God to let us in. Nor is God obligated to reward someone for gaming the system, right? This is literally how we use our economy to exploit the vulnerable. Which means we're not using Jesus' kingdom thinking. In the end, it's Peter who turns toward Jesus. Two chapters after making himself a stumbling block to Jesus, getting out of the line behind Jesus and getting in front of him. Now he's turning back toward him. He makes the turn that the pious young man can't stomach. He names what they've given up to be where they are with Jesus here. And Jesus gives him the only certainty that we can give one another. That this is true wealth. Being here, on the other side, dwelling in the kingdom work, is the very assurance we crave. It's seeing this other side, the kingdom realized, that propels Jesus' teaching. And it informs how we learn, how we teach, and how we live as disciples, apostles, and saints. We welcome children, for hospitality is central to our community. We share in our abundance, for God is generous with us. And we show mercy, grace to one another, because that is the work. This is living, true, eternal life. We will continue with the prayers of the people, um, the response um, for um, each of them is Lord have mercy until we get to the end when we uh, lift our voices with all creation. The response is to you, O Lord. 
let us offer prayers to God who gathers the poor in the kingdom. For Michael, our presiding bishop, Jennifer, our bishop, Drew, our priest, Debbie, our deacon, for this holy gathering and for the people of God in every place, Lord, have mercy. For the Church of the Province of West Africa, our companion diocese of Brasilia and Haiti, St. Luke's Shelbyville, and our 7th Street Church neighbors, Lord, have mercy. For mercy, justice, and peace among all people, Lord, have mercy. For good weather, abundant fruits of the earth, and peaceful times, Lord, have mercy. For our city and those who live in it, and for our families, companions, and all those we love, those celebrating birthdays, especially Lisa O'Donnell, Matthew Latta, Leah Myers, Max Ritchie, and Ellie Thomas. Lord, have mercy. For all those in danger and need, the sick and the suffering, the poor and the oppressed, the hungry and the homeless, and those affected by domestic violence. Lord, have mercy. For those who have asked our prayers, Johnny Western, Robin Wold, Christopher Wagley, the Downs family, Gary Debon, Priscilla Hutton, and Corinne Dewey. Lord, have mercy. For the dying and the dead. Lord, have mercy. Lifting our voices with all creation, with the Blessed Virgin Mary and all the saints, let us offer ourselves and one another to the living God through Christ. To you, O Lord. God, whose word is living and active, hear the prayers we offer this day and help all peoples in their weakness to approach the throne of grace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we to pray, and to give more than we either desire or deserve. Pour upon us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving us those things of which our conscience is afraid, and giving us those good things for which we are not worthy to ask, except through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. God's blessing be with you. Christ's peace be with you. The Spirit's outpouring be with you now and always.